In the year 2050, dark energy is destabilizing the sun, threatening all life on Earth with a new ice age. Scientists conclude that an experimental stellar bomb payload with a mass equivalent to Manhattan Island will flush out the infection and restabilize the sun. The Icarus-1, a prototype spacecraft with advanced heat shielding and a sophisticated artificial intelligence, is tasked with the arduous journey of transporting the payload. Unfortunately, the mission fails. Seven years later, a second attempt is made with the Icarus-2. The crew consists of Dr. Robert Kappa, the physicist overseeing the final calculations for the stellar payload's deployment and detonation, Captain Kanita, the focused, determined mission leader, Mace, the engineer who lends a military perspective to the mission, Dr. Searle, the ship's counselor and medical officer, Cassie, the pilot who serves as the crew's emotional tether, Trey, the tech-savvy navigator, Harvey, the first officer and communication specialist, and Corazon, the botanist who maintains the oxygen garden that provides both food and carbon to atmosphere recycling during the trip. After 16 months of travel, as the ship nears the sun, solar noise known as the dead zone begins to interfere with radio communications to Earth. As the ship encountered the dead zone seven days earlier than expected, the crew is now left with just 24 hours to collect all of their individual thoughts and send each of them off to their loved ones in a last message packet. Kappa has difficulty in finding his words and makes several different attempts at his message, unintentionally running out the clock on Mace. A fight breaks out between Kappa and Mace, which lingers as open animosity between the two, despite Mace's apology. Searle has Mace spend a couple of hours in the Earth Room, which simulates sensual experiences on Earth. Afterward, Mace apologizes to Kappa and they become civil toward each other. When the crew meets to discuss their latest progress, Corazon notes that while the ship is only about two-thirds of the way to its destination, the sun, the garden has been producing oxygen at better than expected rates. The ship already has enough oxygen stored up for the delivery and a quarter of the return trip. Searle has become fascinated at looking out from the ship's viewport at the approaching sun and is curious what it would be like to experience the unfiltered view. The AI warns him that he can only tolerate 3.1% of the actual light, and Searle has Icarus set the system for 30 seconds of viewing at that rate. The result has some kind of effect on Searle, who begins to spend many hours in the viewing room, repeating his exposures to the sun so often that his skin eventually peels away and sores cover his face. Captain Kanita has been researching the video logs of Captain Pinbacker, the commander of Icarus-1, in an attempt to discover why the original mission failed, and thereby prevent his crew from making the same errors. He plays one video where Pinbacker describes a small meteor storm that did superficial damage, and is puzzled by Pinbacker's aloof reaction to the event. As the ship approaches Mercury, Harvey picks up a signal from the Icarus-1's distress beacon, only hearing the faint signal because it was amplified by the iron in Mercury's mass. Emphasizing that some of those aboard Icarus-1 could still be alive, Captain Kanita explains this point to the crew, and begins a discussion as to whether the current mission should be altered in order to check on the Icarus 1's distress beacon. Mace is not happy with the choice to divert from their flight path because their mission to deliver the bomb has the utmost priority. Dr. Searle says that he agrees with Mace's assessment, but adds that diverting to the Icarus 1 could possibly add a second payload bomb. He argues that since the Icarus bombs have never existed before and therefore have never been actually detonated either, their existence is entirely theoretical, and having two could be advantageous if something went wrong with the first one. There is further heated discussion, which Captain Kanita finally stops by saying he is handing the decision to the ship's most informed person in these matters, their nuclear physicist, Kappa. Kappa is troubled by being asked to make this decision. He explains to the captain that he simply doesn't have enough information to make an informed and rational decision and the best he can do is to flip a coin. When Kanita asks, so, heads or tails, Kappa replies, heads, two last best chances are better than one. Kappa's decision is finalized by the captain. Both Icarus crafts will rendezvous together. Trey plots the course, checks it three separate times, and is satisfied he has been accurate. Trey shifts the Icarus 2's course to intercept the Icarus 1. In the many calculations, Trey misses one the need to readjust the heat shield that protects the ship from the sun's radiation. This error is discovered when there is an emergency declared by the computer 
after slight damage to the heat shield results from Trey's mistake. The true extent of the damage can only be assessed and repaired by leaving the ship and working directly in space. Captain Kanita asks for a volunteer to accompany him and, after refusing to allow the second-in-command to join him, Kappa is volunteered by Mace, Mace's way of stating that the current events are a direct result of Kappa's decision to alter the original mission, and the volunteering is clearly made in anger, and not by deciding if Kappa was the best man for the job. Nevertheless, Kappa accepts the implicit challenge, and Kanita agrees to let him accompany him on the spacewalk. As Captain Kanita and Kappa exit the ship in EVA suits to begin repairs, Cassie moves the Icarus 2's position so as to provide the two spacewalking astronauts as much shade as she can. She does this knowing it will result in the loss of the two communications towers needed to return to Earth later. The tips of the comm towers burn up as they continue to revolve around the living quarters, in and out of the sunlight. Consequently, Cassie unwittingly sets off another chain of events, when the still revolving and burning remnants of the communications tower causes a beam of sunlight to deflect towards the center of the ship and onto the oxygen garden. A fire breaks out that initially the ship copes with, but soon it flashes out of control and threatens not only the garden, but the entire ship itself. Corazon rushes to her rapidly burning garden and requests entry, thinking she can save it, but Mace, weighing up the situation quickly, realizes that the mission and ship will be lost unless drastic action is taken, so he orders the computer to rel. During this event, the AI begins to take automatic control of the Icarus 2, in order to return the heat shield back to cover the living quarters, as continued exposure threatens the mission, which due to Cassie, is now protecting the two astronauts from being vaporized by mere direct exposure to the sun. Cassie realizes that this maneuver will result in the death of the two spacewalkers, and she tries to countermand the order but the AI refuses to be ignored. Cassie and the AI fight over control for a few moments, with Cassie eventually using an override command that needs to be authorized by a second crew member. Cassie turns to Mace to have him say his authorization code, but he refuses. He believes the mission far outweighs the loss of Kanita and Kappa. Cassie pleads with Harvey, who immediately issues his authorization. Silently disagreeing, Mace directly calls Captain Kanita and asks him to support him, countermanding the orders issued by Cassie and Harvey, a decision that will result in his own Captain Kanita's death and of Kappa. Kanita agrees with Mace that the mission is more important than his and Kappa's life, and the captain tells the AI to resume corrective shading and proceed with the mission, which it does. As the cover for the two astronauts is dimished, Kanita orders Kappa to go back to the ship as he patches the last of the heat shield damage by himself. Kappa complies, and shortly after Kanita fixes the remaining damage and then meets his demise with exposure to the sun. Because of the loss of their oxygen garden, the astronauts now have no choice but to intercept Icarus-1. Trey still blames himself and is put on suicide watch. Now alongside Icarus-1, Searle, Kappa, Mace and Harvey board to discover that there is enough food to last a flourishing oxygen garden, and a workable payload. However, there has been extensive damage to the ship's computer servers, which will not allow the ship to move. A video log from Pinbacker, now sporting signs of disfigurement, suggests that the crew chose to scrub the mission, believing that humanity's impending destruction was God's will. Additionally, all crew members are found burned to death in the viewing room, the result of the filter having been turned off. The comment is made that if the Icarus-1 were not behind the shield of Icarus-2, those seeing the burned crew members would suffer the same fate. While the crew are investigating, the airlock connecting the Icarus-1 to the Icarus-2 is mysteriously destroyed, and both ships are pulled apart. They find one EVA suit that would let Kappa go back, as he is the only one able to deploy the payload to Icarus-2. Harvey disputes Kappa being given the suit because of his status as captain following Kaneda's death. Searle stays to manually open the shafts, while Harvey and Mace use the insulation of the ship to cover themselves so they can hold on to Kappa, as he is shot towards the Icarus-2 and make it in themselves. During the actual trip, Kappa loses his grip on Harvey, who drifts off into outer space and is frozen. His body can be seen breaking apart when it collides with the ship, and burning up when his corpse leaves the protection of the heat shield. May suffers frostbite but lives and rapidly recovers. As Icarus 2 leaves, Searle enters Icarus 1's viewing room to prepare for his death, for when Icarus 2 leaves, there will be no shielding from the sun. He burns to death as the Icarus 1 crew did. Corazon calculates how much oxygen they have, 
and how much they need to complete the mission. She concludes there is enough for four of the five of them to live, to deliver the payload. It is decided Mace will kill Trey, but when he goes to carry out the act, he finds Trey has already committed suicide. Mace very viciously smears blood on Kappa's hand, blaming him for Trey's death, and again the two fight. A ends quickly in the low oxygen environment of the ship. In the payload room, the AI tells Kappa, that there is still not enough oxygen for all of them to live until they deliver the payload. He says that Corazon did the math, and there should be enough oxygen for all four surviving crew members. The AI tells him that there are five people on board the ship, the fifth being in the viewing room. Kappa races to the viewing room, and discovers that Pinbacker is still alive. He is terribly burnt everywhere on his body, and is clearly psychotic. He slices a wound in Kappa's chest with a stolen scalpel, and chases him through the ship. Kappa makes it to the EVA suit room, and locks himself in. Pinbacker pulls the safety lever, trapping Kappa in the room. Pinbacker then removes the ship's computer servers from their coolant, just as he did on his own ship. In the burned-out oxygen garden, Corazon finds a single seedling rapidly growing out of the newly burnt soil, giving her and the mission hope of not just survival, but even returning to Earth. As she calls Kappa and Cassie to the room, Pinbacker kills her. Mace goes into the cooling unit to fix the Icarus II's mainframe, by immersing himself in the coolant. He is caught in the machinery, his leg injured and bleeding, and he eventually freezes to death. Pinbacker also chases Cassie, who hides in the front of the ship, in the nuclear payload. Trapped in the EVA suit room, Kappa talks to Mace before he dies. Mace, in agony from the freezing coolant, tells Kappa, He'll have to manually decouple the nuclear payload from Icarus, and fly it directly into the sun. Kappa escapes from the room by donning an EVA suit, puncturing the inner door with a welding torch, and releasing the outer airlock door. Many of the ship's loose contents in Corazon's body fly out of the ship, and Kappa gains access. He decouples the payload, and walks to the front hatch of the ship. As the payload and Icarus II drift apart, Kappa uses the propulsion unit of his EVA suit to fly to the payload. As he reaches it, the payload's thrusters fire, burning up part of Icarus II. The rest of the ship burns up and explodes. Kappa goes into the payload to manually pilot and ignite it. There he finds Cassie hiding and is confronted by Pinbacker. The two grapple with the psychotic Pinbacker and escape his clutches. Kappa manages to ignite the payload, and as the nuclear reaction begins, he finds peace, accepting his death and staring into the flames of the sun as it looms ever closer. Back on Earth, Robert Kappa's sister Paloma Biza, and her children, Archie and Sylvie MacDonald, are outside in a park covered with snow as she watches the last message sent to her by Kappa. A brighter-than-usual sun is seen finally breaking through the clouds over a frozen Sydney harbor, showing that they succeeded in their mission.